The merry brown hares came a leaping over the crest of the hill. When the clover and corn lay asleep in, under the moonlight so still, leaping so late and so early, till under their bite and their tread, the sweet and the wheat and the barley lay cankered and trampled and dead. A poacher's poor widow sat sighing on the side of the moss pattern bank, where under the gloom of the fir woods, one acre of ground lay in rank. She watched over barely grown. Welcome to the Crash Chords Podcast. We are continuing our ever-present mission to get every wasty on the podcast, promoting their solo art as well. Ever-present? Shut up. It's late. <laughs> it's present. <laughs> they don't know that. It could no, be like 9 a.m. You're supposed to be like at your peak. Ever it present. could be nighttime on the internet. You don't know. We've made jokes about him peaking before, too, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, our guest this week is Molly of the Wasties. Hi. Um, who has a very successful folk career in her own right, and we're going to talk about that. I don't know how successful. Oh, stop. <laughs> um, For sure. Moderately successful. We'll call it moderately. Um, we're going to get right into the album review this week, and Molly brought it for us, so why don't you tell us what the album is and a little bit about it. Uh, so this is an album, it's a self-titled album by a band called The Once. They are from Newfoundland. It's a trio and um, they're pretty fantastic. I had the pleasure of meeting them all at the Goderich, Ontario Celtic Music Festival, and they were the headliners there when my band was performing as well, and they were incredible. Um, so yeah, I figured that would be a fun thing to bring to you guys. Would you call them an influence for you, particularly? Um, yeah, to a certain extent, particularly in stuff that's happened uh, that I've developed since then. Um, <clears throat> 
a lot of the material that uh, that I play with my band Miss Covered Mountains, which is a band with my mom, Donna Hebert, and a guitarist named Max Cohen, uh, we had already selected, and a lot of it hasn't, hasn't really um, changed. It changes little by little, but our core material was already developed when we actually went to this festival and first saw them. But definitely in stuff that I want to work on in my own right, a huge influence, particularly um, Geraldine. I really love her voice. I think no more appropriate than any other guest that we had <laughs> that this album, is, I should be, all right, if you like this music, go listen to Molly's music. <laughs> go listen to our guest's work. Um, also, really quick before I forget, the intro song this week, of course, like we always do, is a guest song. I asked Molly to perform one of the songs she sings with the Wasties, Bad Squire, which is actually by Chumbawamba. Well, it's not, um, it's an old ballad, but... The version you heard yeah, was the... version we the... first heard was Chumbawamba. Which is interesting to me, because it sounds nothing like Tub Tub Thing. <laughs> um, if you were born after the 90s, don't worry about that reference, you won't get it. <laughs> but let's move on it's to the first enough. track, um, which is apparently a Sandy Danny cover. Sail Away to the Sea. Did I write the title down right? Yeah, and it's Sail actually, um, it's by Dave Cousins, I believe, and then Fairport Convention covered it. Oh, okay. Um, so that was the but, uh, train. But yes. So the, the album starts kind of mellow, um... You no, know, nay, nay, nay. Already refuting. Doesn't start mellow. <laughs> when her vocals come in, which is there's not a long wait. There, when her vocals come in, I'm immediately being pierced by them. They being are pierced. Right I love how the, we right begin. to the soul, right to the soul. I <laughs> love her vocals from the get go. We begin by disagreeing with someone else's feelings and impressions <laughs> on the album. <laughs> but then again, we had that in droves last time we were here at this particular recording venue with. Future Islands, episode 104. This wasn't... This wasn't... <laughs> oh, my God. This wasn't just mellow. It was melodic. Yes. But I'm, I'm not going to go as far as to say mellow. It's, okay. There's, there's a little bit of a get-up to it. Uh, I'd say relaxed, it, maybe. Yeah. But it doesn't it doesn't lack for, uh, for a rhythm or a drive. And again, I agree with you. I think that, uh, that her vocals are really stunning, particularly, you know, you, you almost... We mentioned this later, and I'm sure it'll come back... But over the course of the album, the vocals are definitely the thing that sticks with me. I think the vocals are are pretty much the primary point of this album. If you're listening, she has a way of sort of drawing you to what she's saying, the whole story that's there. The instruments are a little bit secondary. They provide the mood uh, that's very important. What I noticed here in the very first track was that the intro itself, which was just, um, just I believe it was mandolin, and it was a lot slower than the actual main section of this piece. Yeah, it had this very, so. very rubato kind of, you know, meandering itself, not quite getting to the point yet. And then all of a sudden, the drums step in, and then everything is a lot more regular. Excuse me, the, the secondary guitar, the, the rhythm guitar steps in. Yeah. And then it's much more, you know, it keeps you moving, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's more of a straightforward tale at that point. Then it, it commands you shift attention to the vocalist. It, 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 is, it does have a very storytelling aspect as well and uh her pacing is another thing that gets me drawn in here the way she holds her notes really adds a a little bit of a mystique to something that kind of is every day not actually every day that definitely not uh anymore but it's it, it adds a mystique to something that she's talking about that's kind of well, normal. It's not as if she holds her notes for an incredibly long duration. It's more just the slight decay of her note over the course of perhaps like a beat. That itself is very controlled. It's very dynamic just in the, in the way in which she just tapers off the end of one particular phrase before beginning the next. That's something, that's something you don't really find in every single singer. Many singers, you know, they just kind of hurry it along, get to the next verse, and then just sing it as is. Yeah. With her, it's much more about dynamics. One thing I can't stand is when people kind of over-sing things. Um... And it's something you find a lot, particularly when classical singers come into folk music. They tend to bring that drawn out, Mm -hmm. held out last note that feels like it's just there for the sake of finishing the phrase instead of actually having a reason behind it. Yeah. I think one thing that she manages to do is she manages to keep things both melodic and conversational at the same time. That's a good point. You feel like she's talking straight to you. That's exactly what I was, what I wanted to say. Um, but with not as good use of words. <laughs> I'm not good with words. We know this. Well, I think it's because of the whole, the, that raw emotionality that folk is supposed to convey. It's for the common man. So we're kind of, you know, flying by the seat of your pants and almost delivering it as a stream of consciousness is something that I think people really, really want to hear when they, when they come to folk. Because 
it, that's raw emotion. It's not controlled. It's not it's not uh, packaged and then sold as a particular emotion. It's just what is going on at that moment. You almost can imagine that like an hour before said song was recorded, she was actually going through this particular problem. Yeah. Yeah. I also really like, and you get it from the very first track, the, the one of the main sources of percussion on the record is a boron, which I'm a fan of to begin with. But I like how it's used in a very unique way, especially in the first song. The pops and the sounds that it makes to accent the song it shows a great control in using the boron, using both hands, and, and makes a rhythm that sounds to me as good as a full drum set, but through one instrument. It's because you don't want anything in folk, because you're looking for that sort of pared down style, you don't want anything that's that's overt, anything that takes uh, that takes the spotlight away from either the vocalist or even the rhythm guitar in the background, which is really the tone that you want to to be the constant. Any anything more, like a drum kit, a full on kit would, would sound absolutely awful. I think you had actually told us a little story beforehand. Yeah, um, so uh, one of the introductions of the Boron into contemporary folk music was a guy called Sean O'Rieta, I want to say in the 50s or 60s in Ireland. Oh, 50s. Um, and he originally, for the Kaylee dances, they had a kit drum um, as part of the big ensemble. And he hated the kit drum so deeply in combination with that music. Or maybe he just had a grudge. But um, he... He was a very influential Irish composer, and he took all kit drum out of any of the music that he performed or wrote and put a boron in instead. He thought it supported the music in a stronger fashion, and I tend to agree. I think the kit can work in specific circumstances, but I think if you're going for something a little more subtle, the boron fits. I think it survives today in forms of like indie folk and things like that. You might find a kit, but then yeah. you're probably doing a little bit of fusion between folk and rock, so that's yeah. clearly not what raw folk is going well, for. The boron kind of replicates just a, a foot stomp, and I think that kind of ties in the whole home feel that folk has always had. That it should the, be played in your kitchen. Not <laughs> your kitchen, your barn, your <laughs> yeah. whatever. Yeah, your throw shack. In, <laughs> throw in stereotype gathering type place. Yeah. It's it's something that you can just tap your feet to, quite literally in some cases, and that's what this is going for. It has it has that 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 just slam your feet on the ground, clap your hands kind of a feel to it. The yeah. instrument the instrument slung around your shoulder and the, the the stuff around you exactly. And yeah. plus, you can bring it to your friend's house. You could bring it to ABC. Yeah. It's hard to transport a lot of drums, but when you <laughs> when you visualize that single percussion piece, yeah. well, your your friends are going to show up with. A fiddle, a, a single drum, and maybe an upright bass or something like that, and yeah. boom, that's the band for the party. Yeah, and I would feel remiss if I didn't say there's a general tendency in people who are just picking up the boron, who are just doing it, to uh, to play the whole melody of the song, to play the rhythm exactly of the melody. Say, you know, it's something like ba da 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 da, and that's what the fiddle is playing. Da 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 da. The boron will go bum 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 bum, and it's a thing that happens a lot. And I think one thing that's super important is to come to the boron from the background of other percussion, because then you know where to leave space and where to fill it. Um, and I think they do a great job with that in this. Yes, that makes sense. You definitely get a sense of how the song feels simple but not boring. It's not dull. It's just it it gives itself space. Which is, there's a lot of on this record. And it also showcases, for the first time, towards the end of the song, the harmonies uh, the two other gentlemen in this band can do. I love the the contrast between their deeper background vocal work with her uh, very much front and center in the stage kind of work. Because it adds a, a softness to it that it's hard to hit for her in that in that higher range. Well, the duet at the end, I mean, is very straightforward. It's a lot of just singing ah and ahs and ahs for pretty much the, du uh, the duration of the, um, the outro. And there was definitely a crescendo at that moment that I really, really liked, which, again, is the dynamics that I'm looking for. But I felt like there was never any big turnover or culmination with that final outro, which means that it functioned as an outro, which, which probably went on a little bit longer for my taste. So that was just one little, um, little, little gripe that I had just at the end of the song, because it did... It did make it clear that you know I was getting a, a almost the packaged pop structure of folk, I was and say, I wanted it to all go of those on. Those Oz um, 
all of those odds kind of are something that Mumford does a lot. And I think yeah. they've yeah. taken something that would be a kind of, would fall into a traditional land and it now is more reminiscent of pop because of what they've done with it. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's that's come up on the podcast. It's pretty before, sad. Actually. More reminiscent of a thing that borrowed from an earlier thing, which is pretty sad. But that's just the way the, the and, zeitgeist changes. And it's also it's interesting because that's a thing a lot of uh, folk musicians are really afraid of. It's not that they don't want the tradition shared and passed on. It's that they're worried that if people borrow from the tradition, a tradition and don't credit where they got it from, the tradition will die out because all that people will remember is the pop music. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think this is a good place to segue to our second track, um, Nell's Song, um, which is distinctly different, even though still not overly complicated from the first track, because it's got, from pretty much the get-go, this kind of swaying waltz sound. It's a, it's a straight-up waltz. So, so it is. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it, it's definitely a waltz. It's, I mean, first of all, that's the boron is, is, is holding the first of those three beats yeah. very firmly. So you're in three, and you can't escape from three. It's a, it's a log... <laughs> It also it yeah. also contains the accordion, yes. and in this I would I would argue that it's not just a waltz. It just that feel just growing up. I'd say that breathing the accordion puts in it firmly puts it in the Americana folk as opposed to any other type. I mean, I would disagree with that only because I know a lot of. A lot of Irish folk, a lot of French Canadian folk has a lot of uh, little squeeze box accordions in it. Probably French well, Canadian primarily, which because the band is from Newfoundland, they get a really interesting blend of a lot of the French Canadian Quebecois traditions and a lot of the influence from over in Scotland from the people who were um, were colonizing, whatever, immigrating. moving over, immigrating to yeah, Newfoundland as well. Way. I remembered um, a word. I'm so happy. <laughs> well, I would say that most of our folk kind of uh, comes from the Irish tradition more than anything else so I can I, w I would still make the argument that it, as Americana not just depends where you are not well, just US but Americana in general just, just in Australia how do you feel bit. about Zydeco I don't know them they've got a lot of accordion and they're uh, something that came out of folk music from when the Acadians got bumped down to uh, to Louisiana area and that kind of area there's a ton... It's interesting. Take a listen to Zydeco and come back to me on that. I'm intrigued as to how you feel because for me, um, the squeeze box and the accordion fall firmly into the French-Canadian music as well. I wouldn't do too much arguing on that one. <laughs> Especially when you say something like... Uh, uh, you said St. Louis, right? Yeah. Biggest area. Sorry, not St. Louis. Um, New Orleans, too. I didn't okay. mean St. Louis. Even, I don't know where anything is in the country. Even better. <laughs> heavy Just French to not stray on yes, okay. yeah, point here, and that is anyway, the yeah. waltz factor. It's clearly a waltz. It is a waltz. Everybody knows it's a waltz. <laughs> Here's the thing. As much as you might say it's not just a waltz, yes, it has other things to it. Waltz is just the broad category under which the only implication might be dancing. In which case, no, this is probably a little bit, a little bit too slow that I could really envision a, a solid dance being brought to the table here, but it's, you know, it waltz is used for plenty more than that. So Possibly a performance dance? Yeah, or, or a group or dance? At a contra dance, people would dance to something at this tempo. A sure, one, two, sure. three. But that's kind of the only context where you would see it danced, right. in, like, you know, in this era. Um, one and thing I did notice, oh, sorry, uh, just, just about the intro of this track, I really like the intro just because it doesn't keep you on the edge of your seat. It's, it's the fun thing is that Considering it's a waltz, I feel like because you know you're going to get this consistent 3-4 for the duration of the track, they really decided to just expedite the exposition here. They just mm -hmm. moved it along and got to that section. They had an intro, and I think it was something like, there's a drum on the first beat, it keeps it very regular, and then there's four bars of just hearing the guitar riff, and another four bars of the whole... Uh, the riff that they keep um, the vocal riff they keep returning to the da 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 in the background yeah. and that starts in just the second four bars but you'd expect that to be the kind of thing that draws on for a little bit before you're dropped into the first section instead it's just four bars of this four bars of that and then all of a sudden they're in the first verse I like the fact that they just moved that you know ahead it was something positive I think for, for this kind of style because of the fact that <laughs> you don't want to prolong something that is predictable yeah that's a thing that is definitely true in a lot of folk music because it's simplistic and because a lot of times the chorus and the verse will have the same melody or um or it's kind of moved more by its lyrics than by a huge drastic change in the music yeah um that things tend to not 
go on too long. Unless you're listening to one of those old child ballads that has like 1,800 verses, in which case, good luck. <laughs> well, one of the things I really like about this too is it's um, it's a common theme. You know, there's a, first of all, there's a lot of ocean and seafaring themes in this album. Obviously, as they are from Newfoundland, which is a big old island. But um, and that's another thing that sort of is, is I, I think, a little bit ingrained in just common culture between relating a three-four rhythm with the sea. I don't know, just something about, you know, the flow, the, the, the waves, and the way you just go up and down and up and down. You I feel, can totally like, Three that. feels like the proper rhythm for that. Yeah. But um, the story behind it, I think, is really beautifully articulated, too. It's, it's a common theme, but I think it's really beautifully done in the lyrics. And it's the woman waiting for her sailor to come back. Yeah. And he hasn't. Yeah. He and just it's, he it's... hasn't come back. She's old now. <laughs> and she and doesn't know what happened to that's him. That's a thing. Another re- that's probably another reason as to why it gets away with just sort of being this consistent round for the whole entire piece is because it, you convey the sense of waiting. It's bound to be repetitive. If it were anything yeah. but, then you wouldn't convey the theme. Yeah. yeah, I love when form and content are kind of enmeshed. It's a big that, thing. That's I'm a what fan we look of. for. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what we look for. As long and as it conve- doesn't go too far, and it conveys <laughs> that sadness so strongly because of the fact that it's this repetitive waiting and the lyrics, and of course her vocals. Are I beautiful. mean, there are moments that, just from a musical standpoint, I can't help but you know set the art aside and just kind of I want a little bit more. But there are there are uh, doses in this in this track that do keep it interesting. For instance, it's not just continually verse to verse to verse. It goes goes into instrumental uh, interludes at times. There's a mandolin solo which I particularly liked, and even that itself does not really stray from the the round that is this three four process. It's just steady eighth notes. It's not doing anything fancy. It's not this super colored solo. Just steady eighth notes of the course of that those three beats. But it's 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 deliberate, and it almost keeps you in the same exact trance that the vocalist is keeping you in. Well, and not, I think that's an effective solo. It's not just it's not like a solo solo as we would uh, call by today's standards. It does a great job of as a transitioning piece to keep the flow from breaking up with no, these instruments. No, I actually would call this a solo. I mean, when I when I first heard it, I, I first kind of accepted it as, as an interlude, but I realized that it, it, it is kind of the spotlight or the culmination. If this if yeah. this piece were to have any culmination, I think. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm in agreement. I'm actually excited to get to the third track. And we have a final solo also, which which just sort of takes us out of this. So there yeah. is like that, that secondary culmination, and that serves as a good transition to the third track, I think. Yeah, which is Made on the Shore, which I was listening to when I listened to the album, and I'm like, huh, this sounds familiar. I wonder if the Wasties are planning on doing this song. Lo and behold, they had played it twice, and I heard it, but didn't remember. <laughs> so, um, which, I, as I recall, you sang, yes? Yes. So you sing this song um, in the Wasties, but um, what I liked instantly about this song was the more modern kind of sound it had. It was instantly engaging because it wasn't anything like you'd heard at this point on the record. It was, but it doesn't stray from the traditional ideas. No, no it, it not just, at all. It, just it, 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 it seems more primal, more tribal in the percussion, but it still is very much uh, a folk round. Well, yeah, and the, but there is was... It a round or a reel? Um, this... One, two, three. It's in three... No, I, 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 they do throw off the the, the four four cycle in the beginning, four three four yeah. later, but they change it up every once in a while. Um, so I, I couldn't say like right off the top of my head, but I I know what you're what you're getting at, Matt. And it's it's not just a modern sound. I think I think John was also right to say it sounds primal, and I think one of the reasons for that is because of this this consistent drone that was that was occurring yeah. beneath, which yeah. was all in fifths, and fifths have this very open sound. So all of a sudden, when something is fifths, it's like it brings to light rolling pastures you can see that up to the horizon and there's something about that expanse that really lends to the color of this particular track over i think the previous two see i think that's one thing the previous two tracks were lacking was that that exploration of of uh of of just setting really it's like they gave me the content but they didn't paint the picture and this is doing both and the way the percussion drives it it drives in a way that you can almost hear it as two different things or i do at least you can hear it as like a cantering horse almost or, I can see that in a or sense. Or as someone like literally on a ship, like swinging from rope to rope. One, two, three, two, two, three. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Like, there's definitely a feel of of movement, and it's really yeah. strong. Even yeah. even when it goes through its uh, transitions into different complications, because this song does progress a little bit differently than what we've already gotten. 
Um, I think it's also more actually, dynamic than previous tracks. Yeah, yeah definitely. It, there's, there's almost an A, B, C, even though it, it's... I wouldn't go that far. It's still it's around, so it means it uses solid, the same structure and then it does, reinvents it and la- relayers it as, yeah. it as it progresses. It's and not that, easy. Well, the, yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> um, but it does, it does rise up. It does add a lot more invigoration into the actual song. It, it brings it to a higher level. And this is also coupled with... The shorter note work she's doing. We already said that um, uh, Ger- uh, Geraldine. Yes. I looked. I looked it up. I needed. I wanted to know her name because we're going to talk about her a lot. She likes to keep her notes shorter, but this one almost becomes clipped and concise in some areas, and it 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 excels at creating a great pacing for the story. Yeah, well, that's I'd, being built here. Well, I'd said at the beginning that, well, not the beginning, but towards the middle of the song that I really liked the pacing of how she sang. This flow that she had was different than she had done before because there was a lot of swaying kind of flow to the other songs, whereas this one had stutter stops and kind of shifted and went back and forth. And it had, it had, I think that's what also made me feel like it was a little more modern in the fact that the singing was less just harmonic, sweet, sweeping singing, and she was adding a little more character to it. Well, I wouldn't say that her, her, her singing... Uh, changes as dramatically as 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 you're making it out, only because she has this sort of consistency, this 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 staple where she's at in terms of how long she might hold notes or how long she might complete phrases for the duration of the album, so that you're bound to notice any any little uh, variance from that sort of personalized tradition. I think one of the things that's really important with this too is, you know, we talked about the dynamic change and the ebb and flow that this song has. Yeah. And I think that a lot of that comes from the backing uh, arrangement and a lot of it comes from her vocals. She's got a great way of just kind of going for it, gung-ho into a verse if it feels like it's, if it feels like it's appropriate. Like it almost... Her voice almost, like, flings itself, if that makes any sense. Like, she can put a lot of strong emphasis behind it in a way that doesn't sound generic. Um, Definitely not generic. Um, I could argue that at times I want a little more oomph, but then I also have to reel back and say, well, if there were any more oomph, then it wouldn't have the sort of sweet, you know, vibe that I think this type of track is is meant to convey. Even so, this track is a little bit more... um, I personally, just in terms of the emotionality of it, I feel a lot more from this track than the previous two. That's well, the first big strong. Yeah, it's, I think that, I think that's also the the layering as they go along, and I don't know. There's just so much going on, even though it still remains fairly simple. And three people could still play this song. This isn't you know yeah. you're getting too complicated. Well, this song is the proof that simplicity is not the end of. The discussion. I yeah, mean, it's yeah. Sim- it's, the previous songs it, were simple in a way, perhaps even more complicated than this. But this is this drives the biggest kick. Yeah. Well, it was also there was this innate, I think, kind of attitude in the performance of the song, the delivery, and the, the singing that kind of also helped me to connect with it. And also, I just the last line where instead of getting the normal "sure, sure, sure" repetition of the line "sure," she ends. It ends with. But to roam all alone on the shore, and we don't get that repetition. We get that finality to it that really it kind of was ends. striking for me. That really I was. I think they do that tag each time, but I think this is the one that she does where they're, they've pulled it away. Maybe they pull it they away, pull, and it's, it's just, just that one left. shore. Yeah, and um, the other thing I was going to say too, and I know this will probably come up with lots of the other songs, but as a feminist, it makes me super happy that they pick all of these songs with kick-ass ladies in it. <laughs> Actually, she sings about kick-ass men, too, later on as well. That's from true. the male point of view. But she also sings... There's a lot of child ballads and stuff where, like, people... Women get victimized, and then, you know... There's a lot of... There's a lot of... Old stereotypes built into a lot of these songs. And then once in a while, you find the ones where... The woman gets to kick everyone's butt. And this is one of them, and I love that. Um, Because she tricks them. She robs them. They tried to take her on the boat and rape her and have her be like, oh, they're gonna, she's going to be my lady now. And instead, she steals all their crap and gets away. Well, I think that's where it's important to kind of bring in time period here. Because even though the time period is very often not 
spoken in these lyrics, you clearly get an impression that it's somewhere pre-1900. Well, you sometime know. when there were still pirates. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> in this case, pirates. In many other folk songs, it could be any time. Yeah. Pre, you know, it could be the Irish Potato Famine. Who knows? Uh, it, it's just, at least when you consider that time period, then of course there's bound to be that, you know, that strong female character is going to really be important because, you know, they either... Either there weren't, they would be, very often they just wouldn't be wrote, written about yeah. if they were there. It's yeah. just so when it comes up in literature, it's a very strong thing. It's yeah. it's an impressive thing in a way. Yeah, I dig it. Um, this is a great place to go to. Coming back to you, which is our first of a few Leonard Cohen covers on the record, um, and it's also our first acapella track that we get. There's several of them on the record. Um, I mean, at this point, we've already spoken quite a bit about how much we love her her lyrics and the harmonies that she does with the male vocalists and this is another track where she, it gets showed off and featured I don't remember was there any instrumentation in this? No this no. was pure acapella This one was the pure this acapella was, This was just her pure singing voice being backed up once again with those velvety harmonies <laughs> um, That's the best way I can put it because I feel the, the men in the back are just so warmly trying to bring her voice to the forefront they, they just lift it up, and this is another time where her phrasing becomes very important, very important to the flow of this song. Uh, she, and they're so together, too. That's the thing. It's, it's, I, I just love the ways, especially when she gets to, in the beginning, the line, and they're shutting down the factory now just when all the bills are due. The way she, she slows down, speeds up, slows down, speeds up, mm-hmm. it's... it's it puts emphasis on certain aspects of the line that you wouldn't normally have, which really gets apart uh, coloring the story in yeah. this case. I think it's another point when the conversationality really shines through, and I think that's an important thing that a lot of, again, people who are classically trained tend to lose. Mm. They tend to lose the fact that you're, you're really just having a conversation with somebody and there happens to be music in the background. And I think that's why, in retrospect, looking on your... Uh pre podcast descriptor velvety John. I think I think it's um it's actually very appropriate because it does convey that that sort of warm natured uh something that's I think that's just closer to you than what you would expect to get from a classically trained musician. You know, that's yeah. that whole high art versus low art thing. And um velvety is a good descriptor just for the vocal timbre itself. Yeah. Now in describing the harmonies then you gotta meticulous. invoke yeah <laughs> words like meticulous and also tasteful because you also don't want to overdo it when you're talking about just this two part harmony. They they have to be in a sync at times and then they have to stray at times yeah. and the times that they stray and hold like varying intervals like a seventh and create that tension. You really need to not overdo that otherwise it will cease to have its power. Yeah, and so, they're in three part, not two part, right? Um, well, I believe just, this was just three two part. of them. No, no, no. I believe it Were was there three, three parts. There's three parts. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, because it's uh, Phil Churchill and Andrew Dale. We should definitely also mention the other members of the band because they do a fantastic job as well. Are I thought both... one might have been the consistent instrumentalist, but no, no, no. They, they all both sing. sing. Okay. Yeah, um, they all sing and they all sing together, and I think it just sounds great. Um, and it's it's a very interesting story too. Yeah, I like uh, um, so far. Even though these aren't anything new, and one of the things, one of the caveats we have is we like new. I'm really enjoying the choices of these uh, covers that they're doing here, of where they're actually drawing a lot of their uh, inspiration from, what they're choosing to bring back into the world as something new. Yeah. Well, and even if the story's been told before, it's how you tell it that can add a dynamic to it. It's how you tell it. And, it, I mean, it, it can't... I think... Uh, this tracks at least as the first a cappella track, which well that falls on at least for the within the context of this album, it falls under the category of of new for for what we're experiencing right now. Right. It has a tendency to grip you because of the fact that you, we just haven't heard it before. You strip away all the instruments for the first time, it's bound to jar you in a sense. Um, so I'm looking for very specific things within this, and that was. Um, not just the overall dynamics that I know that the main uh, vocalist can do, but also this now secondary vocalist. So what I noticed here was that the male vocalist actually had a bit more control in this track, perhaps, than she does, only because he's sometimes there as a, as a, as a firm secondary spotlight, and then other times he's just there in the background. She's still the primary vocalist. It's clear about that in this particular track. But when they're in this sort of constant duet, it's something about the mixing of his voice 
It's two that, voices. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> then I, in that case, I'm talking about one particular male vocalist cannot it's say It's probably him. the tenor gotcha. uh, in there. But there's something about just the ebbing and flowing of his, of his volume itself that I think really aided in not just being a typical secondary guy to be part of this duet or trio, but actually become a little more center stage and then step off to the side a little bit. And they it do was... this all through volume and not necessarily by him being there or not. Well, and also, to be fair, and having sat through the mixing room many times, a lot of that, when you're performing live, is done live. When you're performing for a recording studio, that's done through the mix. Yeah. Um, this is clearly done through the mix in this particular instance, but yeah. it, it, it speaks but, to good production work. Exactly. And they, they, it's very, very, very... Um, it's very well done live, too. I believe I heard them do this live. It's, it's... They're just as good in their harmonies. Yeah. Live. I got to take that into account for folk out, <laughs> because a lot of times I, I do get this um, experience with, with folk bands that sometimes, actually most often, they're better live than they are in studio. Um, so I got I to gotta point out specific things that I hear in the studio, which I know that I would not have heard live. So it's yeah. just, you know, that's something that folk has got to, I think, yeah. I think it's got to sell me on a little bit in, in, in general. Um, and we could t- spend a million hours taking apart Leonard Cohen's lyrics, but for the benefit of everyone staying awake, who's not me, <laughs> we should probably move to the next That would only song. be a problem if we were listening to Leonard Cohen's voice. Uh, <laughs> well, that's also true, but yeah, it's, this is a good point to move to uh, what will you be building? Sorry, I don't know why I stuttered there in the middle. Um, may I just, just add, may I just add one more thing here, because oh. uh, you also noted it too, Matt, that there was a final phrase in this particular track where serving as a pretty interesting transition where the track the the phrase ends not on the tonic but on something I believe it might have been it certainly wasn't the fifth because that would have been a little bit too too uh too teasing but I don't know can you recall it it's the tonic or at least it's the same way prior to the pause yeah and all of it is true all I've said was just instead Oh, that's I'm right. There was that space. Well, it was yeah. the tonic. In which case, the thing that made it seem as if it wasn't time to end the was harmonies the, the, it. the harmonies and also the phrasing therein. Like, it seemed like half of the phrase. Yeah. I thought they almost could have gotten away with leaving the track on that note. But, either case, it was tasteful to pause for as long as they did, because that's not something you hear in studio work at all, because yeah. they expect you to, you know, assume that something's wrong with your CD. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, or that old gag of you're not buffering, that kind of thing. Like yeah. old music where it would pause, wait, you're not buffering. it's loading. Yeah. Um, and the next one's What Will You Be Building? And that's by Amelia Curran. Um, so this one, I, I, from the minute I started hearing it, I kept hearing this twang. And I thought, like, I, sometimes I hear things in the mix that aren't necessarily stylistic. But this one definitely did have kind of a country twang. Stylistically, I mean, it's still... Had strong roots in folk, but it definitely did have, I felt, that country twang to it. Whether it was the vocal delivery or the guitar riffs, I think that's probably the source of it. I think part of it, too, is that, um, and I think it's highlighted in this song a little bit more in the others, the way she bends the notes. Hmm. She's I, never off pitch, but she's sliding into them, and it's it's a she very... She draws them out, and she, she yeah. spaces them it's a very Beautifully. twangy feel. I really felt that in uh, one of the verses where she's going on, I'll write my name on a big piece of paper, I'll write down my secrets, I'll get, I'll get me an acre. Mm-hmm. The cool. way she, everything gets phrasing, and I just, lo- I actually really love the lines themselves, especially, I'll get me a fortune and find me a saver, I'll empty my pockets and go meet my maker. Yeah. I just, the symbolism in those... Uh, sort of buying your way into heaven. Yeah, I love or the writing down, and the writing of your uh, all your sins down and everything like that. Yep. The way she 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 pulls these notes out of it, um, with that backdrop of simplicity, that's there. Yeah. It's just so beautiful. Yeah, I, I gotta point out a catch twenty two here, only because of, of these observations that you're making about uh, the changes in her vocal quality as we go into this track, and that's. The fact that even though I do hear these things, I, I, I want to stress that to me it's, it's in more of a narrower margin than perhaps, uh, than perhaps we're conveying it. Um, and that itself, I mean, it makes me think of other albums, uh, especially folk albums, in which we might come upon a track that is blatantly country, that has firmly shifted gears from like Americana territory into country or varying other regions. Yeah. And then we would mark it as a little bit positive and a little bit negative. For one hand, well, 
it's something new for the album. On the other hand, it's a big genre pull, and that almost takes you away from the from the consistent flow. Yeah. In this particular case, I, I'm left with just the opposite. I'm left with the fact that it's not so much that I'm I'm really affected and like ah, this is a new thing. Not perhaps to the to the extent as you guys, but yet it also keeps a consistent through line there where I can't you know accept. I I'm not being given a track that is throwing me off the rails. Yeah. Well, I, as I said, it had a slight twang. A slight twang yeah, a is, slight I'm, twang. is I'm not blown away by how shifted it is. Yeah. I mean, I was saying yeah, it had no, a slight twang. That's fair enough. This is, it, it's starting, the, the album itself is starting to become sort of something of a, a folk plus. A folk plus this idea, a folk plus that idea. Uh, like Made on the Shore with the, the, the primal drums, uh, the twang here, the uh, acapella in the previous track. It's experimenting with folk, not to some great degree where it's being groundbreaking, but it's infusing a couple different ideas into it. Well, I say this all more flavor. Yeah, a little bit more flavor. Although I, I guess I guess the reason I, I brought that to the table only is only because I guess at this stage here at track five, I was a little bit I was a little bit thrown by <coughs> by not getting something as 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 new or fresher as I had wanted. You know, so far the strongest thing has been track three. In this case, I I was. In, Fortunately, left with saying this was got a little bit boring for me had it not been for the lyrics. The lyrics, I think, is what you really have to to turn your eyes toward in order to really accept this track anew. And there is some very interesting uh, things here. Not necessarily in just turn a phrase, but just in in the lines themselves. I'll write down my secrets. I'll get me an acre. I'll build my fortune and pay for a savior. Yeah. It's just it's this smooth nature of of uh, of conveying such simple ideas I'm, that I I'm, think. I'm really attracted to. I'm so proud of you right now. I've I'm never so cited a lyric before. No, I'm just so <laughs> proud of you. Um, <laughs> so what's funny is that, and then we move to the next track, which I almost feel like is a weird combination of the acapella from before and Made on the Shore. Mm. <laughs> um, because, I definitely see that. Yes, yeah, no, no. The, the this song... Isn't... This is that. That's not a weird comparison. <laughs> so track six is Marguerite, which is another a cappella track. And I'm actually I'm gonna interrupt you right now. So first of all, it's originally by Scott Richardson uh, for the words and Emil Benoit for the tune. But um, the thing that's really cool about it is, as we were listening to it, I looked it up. It's a true story about um, a noble woman who uh, had a dalliance with the, one of the men on her ship, and her uncle or cousin or brother, whatever depends on who's telling the story, stranded her on um, the Isla de Demon, which is the Isle of Demons, on the way to Newfoundland or Nova Scotia. And then she was rescued later on. But she was there for, like, several years, and it was a true story, and then they just took her back to France. <laughs> um, but I thought that was really cool. Um, well, the thing that, that kept this acapella song being unique from the other besides the fact that it was a little different stylistically and it wasn't true, just completely acapella with no instrumentation at all is that that storytelling nature the story is actually interesting the way it's performed is interesting I mean Isle de Demon is um Isle of the Demon uh, yes but it's French right you said Isle so it's they're not it's not Gaelic it's not it's not Spanish. It's the fact that they chose to go with French. It, well, is it a French Canadian tune originally, or? Well, it was written by a guy named Benoit, <laughs> so I'm going to go with probably. probably. I, from what I was able to look up, I saw and a there's... lot of original French lyrics on this as well. Yeah, well, because it's about a French woman. And here's the other thing: is there's a huge cultural um, coming together in a lot of areas of Canada between the Scottish, the Irish, and the French. Um, Depending on where you are, it all comes together. Well, I am drawn to the year, though, specifically, because they say, oh, the year was for 1542 in the, in the springtime of love. And this, I mean, just knowledge of, uh, of, of colonization and whatnot, this would either have to be prior to or, or at the dawn of colonizing that particular part of North America. So hey, I hey, can't hey. Really... A bear got there before everyone else did, my friend. Who was that? Who was that? Um... God, I'm gonna. I think it's Lee Ferrickson. <laughs> no, uh, one of the A Bears was in Canada before Jamestown. Well, that would be quite a bit before Jamestown, though. Yeah. I mean, James. Well, then actually, before before Jamestown was Roanoke, and Roanoke was 1588. Yeah. So this would be 40 years before that. I don't know if I'm buying it yet. I want to say this is still just France, France, as opposed to French Canadian. No, it's, it's a French Canadian song. French Canadian too, but then it was looking back in time to. Uh, uh, 
no. something that perhaps didn't take place in their borders. Well, let's get on the history on this, and it's I will follow up in the interview section. <laughs> well, it, it adds at least to the coldness of where she was placed. If you yeah. consider the fact that this is clearly not a territory <laughs> anybody knows. Yeah, no one's joking with. around. There's also speaking of that coldness. There's a coldness in. In, in how she sings certain parts of the song. Oh, yeah. She's got a little bit of steel in that spine. Yeah. Especially from, we would think back to that time women were supposed to be meek and everything like that. This is another one of those choices of a woman that kicks a little ass. She survived by herself for several years it's, it's full, on an island. It's, it's, <laughs> it's sweet. It remains sweet throughout, but there is a lot of sorrow and a lot of... Not rage, but definitely borderline rage yeah, dripping rage. in certain words. Anyway, we anguish. Should, yeah, anguish is a good one. Yeah. And then it's followed up by a tune that's actually the only instrumental, fully instrumental track on the whole record. Mm. Um, which has I, three titles is the, uh, is the Big Man Within, Hounds, and Gerald Thomas's Burnt Potato, <laughs> uh, which I love as a title, honestly. This um, was a three parter that kind of remained the same throughout, but you can definitely tell the sectional difference. It had a through line, but it did definitely go through sections. It did I, stay completely the same throughout. I especially like the Hound because that was just a strutting, strutting bazooki. Yes, bazooki is the instrument. It's a stringed instrument. It's a Greek instrument. Yes. Yeah, it and is actually. It was, that was really, really fun. I especially enjoyed that center section. It was uh, almost jaunty without really that, yeah. that attitude, but with a whole different attitude of kind of like a bulldog. I, I definitely yeah. see where the word hound comes from here. And it's nice to see that the band stands up even without the vocals. Yeah. And no mean, point in listening to that was I bored, personally. Then again, I am also the child of a professional fiddler. So if I was bored by that, <laughs> I would have died of boredom long ago in my childhood. But <laughs> That's fair. But I mean, the yeah, th- at least just rhythmically, I think it's impossible to be bored during this particular track. This is one of the strongest for me, just because, again, it has that tendency, which I notice is a, somewhat of a, of a returning theme in this album, is going from 4-4 four, four to 3-4 four, back to 4-4. Four, four. Um, and that may have actually occurred over the the transition between these three separate sub songs. And yeah, it, and, and I mean they they were you they were unique enough, like John said, that you could tell them apart, but still had enough of a through line that you could listen to this and believe it's one song as well. Yeah. It had a, an idea. Medleys. Of, yeah, exactly. It's a medley, and it's two three things that suit each other but that aren't the same. And that yeah. you could dance uh, to. Exactly. That was the thing. It did remain danceable, and it remained airy too. It still had yeah. that that outdoor kind of a feel to it. Well, much like track three, this is another one of those cases where we return with the drone, this time yeah. provided by the accordion, which sort of sets you in a mood. So it seems to be one of the strongest things for this album for me personally. Is is it it. it gives you a setting and I think that's that's the most powerful thing here which I have to say back in, in Margarita was a little bit lacking because that was just one little problem there is I feel like that's another track that may have lost this edge if you do not pay attention to the lyrics because otherwise your components are simply um, the vocalist which we've already acknowledged is very talented um, and then just the solid rhythm guitar in the background but now here we have a, a pure instrumental uh, as I was Recall this was an instrumental, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. There yeah. was no vocals. No, none throughout. And yet I was feeling more of the setting that I feel like I should have felt for 1542 Newfoundland. <laughs> right. Um, and the next song is uh, Three Fishers, which is a Charles Kingsley poem. Um, I actually had the honor of performing this in front of uh, Garnet Rogers at the Philly Folk Fest. He did the arrangement for his brother Stan Rogers. Um when it was recorded, I want to say in the 80s. Um, but the thing that I love about this song, first of all, their arrangement, totally different. They add a lot of really cool minor, uh, extra minor chords in that aren't in a bunch of the other versions. And um, I just feel like this is a super example of a really key thing in a lot of traditional folk music that I think sometimes lacks in a lot of more modern folk music, which is the difference between something being sad and something being maudlin. Mm. Because I think there's a tendency in a lot of singer-songwriter work to go, oh, woe is me, oh, woe is me, I'm so sad. 
But yeah, <laughs> and here it's kind of inevitable. It. Inevitable when you take the stage and then you're you're delivering a sad song. You're bound There's to a... almost make it melodramatic. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. This song is tragic. It's about a bunch of men who yeah. go out to sea and fucking drown. So you can't exactly apply melodrama to that because but, but, but there's, there's a the stoicism exactly. With there's the, a with, with with the women themselves, the three wives left, yeah. left on the beach. There's a stoicism involved that just that shows that these these women are probably stronger than their husbands ever were. Exactly. But I love I love when that stoicism begins to crack. The yes. second repetition of the chorus is so heart wrenching because we had already learned these uh, learned who these individuals were, who these women yeah. were, and to see them cracking, to see them falling apart was truly tragic. But here's the thing. It moves forward. Um, there's a whole idea uh, in acting that it's way more interesting to watch someone try not to cry than it is to watch someone cry. Mm. Um, which I think is very true. Well, that, I think, is the thing that I noticed, at least, that goes along with folk period, is that that's not something... It's true that that's what you say. It's not, you, it's not something you find in pop music or that of the other. It's true that that would probably go more toward the melodramatic. And then it's, it's a matter of watching just how melodramatic they can get. But then in folk, the the challenge is exactly just that. It's it's to avoid it and be stoic because it was from a much more, frankly, a much more depressing time. <laughs> and after that instrumental piece, we get this presented with that um, combination of the drum and bass playing the upright bass, yeah, playing on that same note in in unison. That is just so solidifying, yeah. so reinvigorating for what they were doing. I feel like I would be remiss to my boyfriend if I didn't point out the skill in a well-tuned drum. Mm. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> um, which is a thing that a lot of people forget about. Um, but the the one thing I wanted to that I just feel like is super key to the song you know the verse, the last verse after the corpses wash up on the shore is and the women were weeping and wringing their hands for those who would never come back to the town. And that's the part where they crack. That's the part where they get sad. But then the chorus that comes after it is like, and life goes on because men must work and women must weep. For the sooner it's over, the sooner to sleep. Mm. It's like, you gotta get over it. <laughs> yeah, I gotta I gotta even comment on the on the well tuned drum thing that you said before <laughs> here. Because I, I, I have to agree. It's one it's something that's very often left out, especially earlier on in the comment we made about about drum kit music. Obviously that's that's almost a non entity. Um but it, really when you are looking at just like a single drum, whether it be a boron or something else, it tuning is key because that's what's going to sort of bring the drum on your side as opposed to just this this thing in the corner that we vaguely follow. Yeah. You know. Makes everything sound clean. Yeah. And there was that, there is that quality to the Boron where every little, every little tap has this, has like three tunes within it. It's this little parabolic arch that brings it either down or brings it up and then back down. And it's, it's, it's a human quality that you get in drums that you just do not get with a kit. Yeah. I agree. All right. Um, I want to take us now to our third acapella track of the record. Which Willie is... Taylor. My favorite song on the does album. Does this one have a drum, though? Dally, it does. Dally, it, has dally, like dally, a, it has a foot stomp, at least. Yeah. Which I would still consider it a cappella for that. Yeah, oh no, it's still a cappella, but so it's f- got more than some of the others do. First, uh, an important note to make that Molly actually pointed out, so I want to <laughs> leave blame for me, is that they sing about boobs. They do. Moving on from that. Her boobs. Her boobs uh, uh, come out. Her boobs do come out. Um, it's it's a story that Mala had mentioned is actually quite common in folk of the woman dressing as a man to go after her man, get him back, find him, and so on. But I love this song for what it does to what, it takes could, be, what could be considered a trope. Yeah. And turns it on its head a bit. It, this is a storytelling song through and through. It's mostly to invest in the lyrics. There's not really instrumentation to talk about aside from the rhythm that, I mean, doesn't do anything super extraordinary that I can think of. It's mostly about the lyrics and the story. Yeah. So um, go listen to the story. It's a good story. And the story ends up with her Oops. shooting Oops. her cheating husband. Yep. Which yeah. I love because... And then getting made into a ship's commander for just having so much balls. <laughs> like, she was, <laughs> she's the most manliest of men, yes. but still a chick. And the whole thing, just being discovered and what to do and everything like that. Yeah. Uh, the vocals, once again, really convey this woman finding her attitude, finding her spine, and discovering, like, she doesn't need her husband. And yeah. It's a great story, and it's presented 
just beautifully as an acoustic. This is the, really the most impactful piece uh, for me because yeah. of the way it goes. Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's interesting, like, the, the social mores of the time and how that was actually a lot more acceptable than, than, than we realize today, that when, let's say, a... Um, a commander or a politician were to pass away, then it was very acceptable for the widow to actually take their spot. So it does kind of speak very strongly to those that, you know, the ball is there in. Yes. I mean, if they could hack the job, then then they were immediately given, like, world There was respect. less, less yeah. importance of credentials and more, well, you shot him, and you have the gall <laughs> to do it. Here's his job. Not just that yeah. call. But see, that, that her, was taken as, like, well, he deserved it. Her replacement is standing next to him, <laughs> yeah. holding hands, and she just shoots him dead. Yep. Yeah. And then the captain's all, oh, well, that's pretty good. You're in charge. Yeah. <laughs> I Here's love it. shit. Do something with it. One more thing about boobs. When we were discussing... No, no. This is yeah, a relevant yeah, point. Yeah, 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 relevant point, relevant point. Segway... Um, just relating it to, like, folk again and how we were just talking about stoicism, there was this little thing about how they can even gloss over something like that. And you, you barely even notice it because yeah. it's folk. It's, it's folk. It's just, it, you, you are stoic in your delivery of this thing. So what? The boobs came out. If that was a pop style, it would be rounded and, and posted on a pedestal as if to, to make you laugh on the spot. Well, Here, yeah. if it's it were almost a, glossed over. If it, were a folk so- or if it was a pop song, it would just be all about the boobs. Exactly. They would um, just keep going with that. And here, the boob is a mover of the story. <laughs> it actually has a role. Exactly. And moving right on, the next piece is The Deserter, which is, again, a, uh, a trad song, but uh, most probably made famous by Fairport Convention. And this one, I mean, we have another song that has that that breathiness caused by a drone in the background, but this time it's not it's not a um, an accordion drone; it's an organ drone, and the organs actually featured fairly prominently throughout the song as well. Yeah, which I like because it was it still gave that space that I really like on this album, but in a different way. There was still a little tilt to it, so it made it a little bit different. Not so different that it's striking, but different enough that you notice. And uh, this is this is where we were talking about before. This is a woman singing from a male point of view. Something you don't normally hear. Oh, depends uh, on who you're listening to. A mainstream you don't normally hear. Yeah. Unless it's just a short little aside. It happens and quite honestly, a bit in a lot of folk music. It, it sort of becomes gender neutral for that. Yeah. This song undergoes an amazing transformation as it goes along. From sort of a plotting idea into really infusing a lot of tension very simply into uh, what's going on. It still doesn't remain, it doesn't become too complicated, but by the second and third verse, it's, it's obviously some stuff's going down, and it's very, very appropriately put with yeah. the court martial, with the actual having to have sentences passed and, well, trying to desert again and then being assigned to the gallows. I mean, it really is infused with a lot of Drama. Hi, there you go. Hi, drama. A lot of high drama. A lot of, a, a lot of emotion. Yeah. While still remaining kind of separate outside of emotion, because the character itself doesn't actually really seem to feel anything. It's just a recounting of a tale. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a it's a nice duality to it. Yeah, and it really builds in the instrumental arrangement. I think that's where you get a lot of the build from too, like the vocal builds. But I think this is one in particular where. The instrumental really adds to what's going on. Mm. Um, I also think that part of the reason uh, you ju- did just mention high art, <laughs> I think it's because of the phrasing of certain of these lyrics. So I'm going to quote more lyrics to Rattle John's universe. Then up rode Prince Albert in his carriage and six, saying, Where is that young man whose coffin is fixed? Set him free from his irons and let him go free, for he'll make a good soldier for his queen and country. It's all just so old-timey. Yeah. So, again, it's about putting you in that place. And then I think this is a track that, um, that the lyrics and that phrasing does the job of providing setting over that of, let's say, especially Especially yeah. whose coffin is fixed. I really like yeah. just the way that yeah. phrase comes out. Yeah, and that's the just... way it's said. That's just good writing in general. Mm-hmm. Mo- moving on to an- another song now that is also a cappella is... It's a trend. <laughs> it's a trend, yes. On this album, this is the second to last track. This is The Briar and the Rose, famously known by Mr. Tom Waits, um, which you would never guess by hearing the track. <laughs> but at this point, I mean, look, I'm enjoying the album as a whole, but... This song, I felt, was just an a cappella track. The harmonies are beautiful, her vocals are beautiful, but... We've heard that already. The, the acapella nature of it is a lot less impactful 
as what it used to be. It, there's not doing anything differently than what we've already heard. It's the same sort of yeah. It's gorgeous. There's great harmonies, but I'm I'm lo- I'm lo- I'm missing out on that wow factor. That kind of sped out those not not sped out sped out those uh, earlier pieces. They weren't as like just inspiring or as enjoyable as it was before. It was just solid. Well, you know, just in the same way we were talking about Leonard Cohen, Tom Tom Waits is another one of those artists where I feel his songs lend to so many possibilities. Oh, yeah. Um, The only difference being that when you're listening to Tom Waits' originals, they are still quite powerful. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, and, you know, perhaps in the back of my head, even though it doesn't really fall under a... uh, under a rating per se here but in the back of my head i gotta say once i heard that it was a tom Waits song i just uh i had to cringe a little bit i felt like it was not being done justice see one of the things i i feel like this is the thing you can do with leonard cohen it's the thing you can do with tom Waits is you can piece apart the lyrics to have some really full and deep meanings and if we want to talk about forming content i thought i don't know i think there's something about like the bitter sweetness of life and, and coming together of a bunch of different types of things, uh, a bunch of different people, a bunch of different people coming to the end of the road. Down in Brennan's Glen, there grows the briar and the gro- uh, briar and the rose. Mm. Um, I picked the rose one early morn. I plucked, uh, I pricked a finger on the thorn. But uh, the whole idea, I, one thing I love about the, what they did with the harmonies here, and it's something they haven't done yet, is they take the harmonies and then at the end of each line they come back to a unison. Um, and it's, you know, I think I feel like it's super powerful. And I, we talked earlier about how something being a trope versus something being a staple. And I guess for me, the a cappella isn't, isn't quite as prominent in the general folk tradition as it is on this record per se at least not in the style they're doing it but i do still think it's powerful and again maybe the difference is i have listened to this cd fully in order and then also out of order Mm. and i think if you pull it out of context it it changes it particularly maybe for someone who's not used to hearing as much acapella as there is no it's 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 a fair argument i think with me the only the only issue is just that i have heard Acapella, and normally it is that culminating factor of an album. Yeah, it's, it's like that. It's, it's the woo, look at us. This exactly. is our last look, acapella thing. Exactly. <laughs> There's something about about that that chill that goes over your spine at the end of an album when all of a sudden none of the instruments are there, and the the um the effect is so much stronger, especially if there were was previously a mess of instruments. Yeah. You know, and I just feel like that's pr- maybe the only problem with this, although you could also argue that because there's more of a, a consistent um, a consistent through line of thinner instrumentation throughout, that it's not as noticeable whenever you reel back and go to acapella because yeah. it's not like there was a lot there to begin with. Um, but that's that's not saying anything negative to it. Just it takes away from the showman factor, showmanship factor for me, and that's yeah. I think the only thing in in terms of the overall arc and delivery. I'm just not left with the wow. Yeah, but but and the final track I think kind of does give us some of that wow though that we were looking for at least to wrap up the album a little bit. Yeah. Um, so the last track is anthem. Um, which I, I got a, like a rocking back and forth kind of sense from it, and I couldn't figure out why. Um, to say it's Leonard Cohen again, by yeah, the way. it's another yeah. Leonard Cohen track. But John had actually pointed out it had a bluesy kind of soulful, almost gospel. Steve brought it to feel all in that yeah. j- the, the general vicinity, like yeah. this idea that like the verses were very the 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 course the verses were very tight and singular, but then the verses could have been belted out by a gospel chorus and it would not be out of place. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think um, this is one of those moments where the vocals highlight a beautifully constructed lyric. I mean, this uh, is this is the Leonard Cohen master at work right here. Uh, Unfortunately, that doesn't quite speak to the album, but it, it does speak to, to their choice of song. And I mean, just this this. Uh, refrain here. We asked for signs, the signs were sent. The birth betrayed, the marriage spent. Yeah, the widowhood of every government, signs for all to see. It's just so beautiful. I mean, there's a lot packed in there within just a few, just a few words. Yeah. It also yeah. does a great job closing the album itself. It's a, it's a great piece to end the sort of theme that they built into it. The idea of, in a lot of cases, in almost every case, of just uh the inner strength of people, specifically women in a lot of cases, but in general, the inner strength of the common man 
and the things that can fracture it because a lot of cases there are is a fracturing there is a a wearing away which goes to the the sea now uh imagery that's used here the sort of eventually things break through yeah and this idea of the the cracks creating the uh, letting the light in yeah is is great symbolism to sum up this album. Yeah. And well, I think the other thing that's interesting about it and I don't know how much this connects to the album as a whole, but in terms of just like this is one of those songs that I can come back to when I feel like life is kind of shit. <laughs> Excuse my language. Um because as as someone who's a perfectionist and as someone who strives for excellence, in everything, it's good to have a reminder that sometimes imperfections are what makes something beautiful. I think that's summed up in the main refrain. Excuse me, yeah. I wasn't I wasn't repeating the refrain before. That was just a verse. But this is the refrain. Ring the bells that still can ring. I mean, there's just that element of defeat in that single line. And yes, that falls under the umbrella of life being shit. So, <laughs> yeah, that's... that. I guess... It does but, put a period at the end of the song. Uh, for the album as a whole, it definitely, it definitely runs... Uh, Runs down many paths of defeatism, but there's there's very often that coming back at the end there's that hope. exists in some well, of these tracks. The light not all. itself, it's 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 things are going to shit, and there's hope. There's also you're losing some of yourself and letting in something else. It's talks also about change. There's a lot to this song itself, just lyrically, and it does a lot to to cement so many different ideas in this album. I uh, I want to do something a little out of character because we're actually. On a schedule for once, but I would like to have Molly give us a wrap up first, and then we can uh, wrap up after. Um, because we're actually going to do, an, I'm going to do an interview with Molly at another time because she actually has to get out of the city. But I do want to hear Tragically. her review on the album, and then we'll get into ours as well. Because <laughs> I would like you to rate it because that's oh. what we're here to do is to give our review of what we're listening to. Zero to five. So five it's being five. perfection. Zero being. And you can do 4.5, 3.5, you know. Steve's gone three decimals. 4.2. Now, why would you give it a 4.2? What are your uh, negative points on it that bring it down from a perfect recording? That was so quick. Perfect recording? So, (laughs) basically, my thoughts are, I do think in some places it gets a little repetitive. I think that's a thing that they've actually brought to a new level in a lot of their other records that have come out after this. But um, I do think sometimes uh, if it's it's not music, well, it's music that you could put on in the background and kind of not focus on. But at the same time, it's music that if you want to appreciate what it really is, you have to be 100% focused on it because it's so lyrically driven. Um, and what I would say, hmm, what are the other things that make it not a five? I think it's just, it comes down to... Um, too traditional? No, it comes down to not. I love that it's traditional. I come from a traditional background. Um, I think it, yeah, I think it comes down to what you guys pointed out before of um, overuse of a certain of the acapella when I think that the instrumentation could have added to it. Um, but it's still, overall, I mean, I'm also a really hard grader, so let's be clear. I think my album is fantastic, but I still think these guys are, like, oh god, my mom's gonna kill me, my bandmate too, leaps and bounds ahead of us in terms of, like, meticulous, um, and... Music, musical phrasing, perhaps? I don't even want to say musical phrasing, I want to say, like, meticulous... Control? Control and, um... It's very smooth. Hmm. There's no roughness. I almost wish there was a little more roughness. That's why it gets a 4.2. I, I, I wish I there was a little more, a little more not edge. passion, but edge, yeah. yeah. Um, that said, I think they're freaking incredible musicians, and they're stunning to watch on stage. So, yeah, that's why I That was my experience many times. When I enjoyed this album best... It's a little best, too polished. Yeah. Well, when I enjoyed this album best, it had edge. Yeah, and, exactly. You know. The tracks that have edge are phenomenal. You, sometimes you want to to get that kind of old look. Yeah, you so want it to be a little rough. In broken moments. in, even. Yeah. Okay. So my thoughts on the album are this. I feel... I don't know. I'm conflicted. It's like when we did Carbon Leaf, 
Like, I liked a lot of what Carbon Leaf did, but ultimately they ended up being a band that I put in my rotation. And I listened to a fair amount of folk, although, truth be told, a lot of the folk I listen to is by friends of mine who have made it, because they happen to be very good at the folk that they make. Lucky you. Um, but, I don't know, it's... I, I mean, obviously, I'm in love with her voice. It's gorgeous. Like, there's, there's no bones about it. Not this year since St. Vincent have I heard... As beautiful of a voice, I think. Um, my my biggest caveat with the album is I think by the fourth acoustic track, I was just tired of acoustic. And I agree with what Molly said. that Acapella. Acapella, sorry, yes. That, that out of order and on its own, it's fine. I'm sure it ha- is very impactful. But I just, I don't know that by the end of the record, I was just as drawn in. Carbon Leaf was very much on my mind as well. Although I do, I do want to ask you. You said you said that ended up going in your rotation, as in no, uh, didn't. Oh, didn't, didn't go didn't. in my rotation. Oh, excuse me, never mind. Whereas this band, though, oh, I I would be. In, I'm very interested to hear their brand new album. They apparently came out with one this year, so I'm actually very excited to hear that. But I'm also, you know, I I think you know what it really was is I think it's the content. I don't know that I really got into everything that Carbon Leaf was singing about, although there were some songs that I was very drawn to, whereas this, the vocals, especially the storytelling songs, were very engaging, even if there wasn't else a lot going on. I mean, we spoke about, uh, shoot, what was the track? Oh, okay. Willie Taylor. Willie Taylor, oh. which was, you know, ended, like, I could see that scene of this you know, woman dressed as a pirate brandishing two pistols and just taking someone out and then, like, blowing the smoke off the pistols and then raising an eyebrow. Like, I, it was a very visual story. And I could actually imagine the narrative, which was really cool. Um, and there are a lot of moments like that. You know, also hearing The Briar and the Rose, realizing that it was Tom Waits, remembering the Tom Waits version and then listening to this. They're just so different. I have to at least give them credits for making it their own. This is clearly their version of the song. You would have had no idea it was Tom Waits off the cuff. You didn't realize it until Molly pointed it out. Yeah, which can speak sp- positively to it. Yeah, I appreciate that they made it their own. I like when covers are homages, but I more often than I not prefer when an artist makes it their own. However they do that. Um, but there's undeniably talent here. I mean, that the, the Boron player who I'm not sure which of the multi-instrumentalists does play the boron, but the boron was doing pops and fills that I'm not accustomed to always hearing a boron do, so I was very intrigued by that. I thought it added another layer. It made it sound better than a full drum kit would have sounded, I felt. Not to mention the talent that it takes to make an instrument called the boron the most engaging <laughs> instrument. Why, I got, I got to, I got to Why? say... I've I got been to waiting say, on that joke since the beginning. I'm sure I, you I, have. I got to say bazooki today. You did get to say bazooki. I got to say bazooki. Actually, and fun- you spelt it wrong in your notes. I, 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 I spelt it phonetically on my notes. Yeah, which is how I would have spelled it if I didn't check it. <laughs> um, fun fact, while I'm wrapping up, uh, one of the Wasties Rivera owns a bazooki um, and has played it in a few of their performances. Um, I don't even know what the one looks like. Um, it's, it's basically, it's it's basically a, lute, a kind of the Greek uh, version, of the, version of the lute, yes. Yeah. Um, but but in wrapping up, and which is what I'm trying to do in a very roundabout way, I I really do like it. I think that they're I think that they're for traditional music and for folk. It's definitely engaging, and not to say that it's typically not. But like while with Carolina Chocolate Drops, I felt like it was left a little something to be desired because they were so traditional. Carolina Chocolate Drops, for the most part, were so traditional, I was like, okay, well, we've heard this before. Whereas here, there was at least enough, like, a vocalist like this, we don't hear every day. She was very good, and John pointed out she had that perfect meld of inflection and... and, and um, Ability. And ability. You know, she was a talented <laughs> singer, but she also made the singing her own, and if that may come from what Molly said, how they were all actors before they became musicians... So her reflection comes from her acting background. I think that's a strong way to incorporate acting into singing. And I'd say, honestly, I've noticed Sarah do that when she sings. And she's both an actress and a musician. So I don't totally understand that and appreciate it. But that said to the negatives, you know, it's still, there were a lot of cliches. There were a lot of things that I saw coming a mile away that have been done in songs before. But I didn't enjoy it less knowing it was coming. So that's why, for me, it's a little lower than Molly's ranking. It's a solid four. 
there's no denying the talent of this band, and there's no denying that they did some interesting things on quite a few songs, but there wasn't a not enough variety of interesting for me to put it beyond a four. But it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't bad, and there wasn't a bad moment, so I can't bring it below a four either, because the talent of the singers alone carries it through to that, plus a lot of the instrumentation that I enjoyed a lot, like the all of the drones, I thought added a world to the, a lot of the songs that they were in as well. So that's where I stand with the album. The biggest attractor for this album, to me, is the fact that it was covers. And not because I don't think covers can make... that. that, that just by covering something, you're not making something new. In this case, for the most part, the covers were already within the same realm of what they're producing here. It's not like they're reinventing a rock into a folk, or a folk into rock, or whatever. They're staying within the same realm and sort of reskinning these ideas as opposed to recreating different ideas into a folk setting. That being said, the choice of the actual covers, on the other hand, was really thematically solid. It it created not an actual story, but a idea presented over and over again of Solidity in the common folk, solidity in your better halves or your other halves. Uh, that is just really, really awesome. It's a, it's a great amalgamation of ideas put together to just say that even though you may be the woman, even though you may be the peasant, even though you may be the conscripted soldier, you are still a solid, powerful being. You still have inner strength. You may not have the ability to shape the world, but you still have the ability to be a a building block in something, to have merit outside of, of just what you may think. It's beautiful that way. It's a great, great idea. I like it. I really do enjoy it. And if it wasn't for the vocals, that would be the extent of it, because musically... There's very little going on there that really invigorates. There's three, four songs out of this dozen that, that, that really brings something different to the table. And even then, it's not really new. It doesn't really push the envelope. But then again, this album is not about vocals. With four um, tracks with just vocals, you're, you're, you're saying this song is all about the singers. And... All three of them do a beautiful job. Uh, amazing job. I mean, for once, we didn't keep going, well, it goes without saying that the vocals are great. No, we kept saying that because it was important to mention that this is happening, that that is happening, that this vocalist has range, that this vocalist is trying things that are a little bit different, a little bit outside the realm of what we expected. But it's it's not new. That's, that's what I, I'm going to keep coming back to. It's not a new thing. In any way, shape, or form. It's a great homage, but I I don't find any freshness, anything that is expanding folk itself. So for that, while it's great quality, it's still just a four. It's still a solid four, but it's still just a four. It doesn't bring anything to the table that that I thought could go somewhere. It it already went here. Um Matt's earlier comparison to our review of Carbon Leaf back in episode 99 was very much on my mind for the duration of this of this podcast. And you wouldn't be you if you didn't reference the exact number by memory. No, because I think people should go back and check out that album. It's it's um it's an appropriate comparison. That album specifically was a uh guest. Well, it was also a guest and a al- um a returning guest as well. A returning guest, that's a right. A lot a lot of things coming together. That is right. That was Joe Rude. Joe Rude. And Joe Rude uh, brought us this this album, Carbon um, Ghost Dragon Attacks Castle, which the, the shtick of Carbon Leaf is that they tend to do Irish folky stuff. So they are just as much a throwback band as 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 this is in many ways. Yes, they're trying to bring new things to the table, but in general, it all comes back to that same thing. It is it is folk. It is a rendition of things that have been done in some sense for hundreds of years. It's something that you cannot put a hundred percent out of your mind. As as much variety as can come from that. Um, and I found that my rating for this had to go in a very similar direction 
uh, except for just a couple of things. And that's only because I found that both of these albums, the disparity was almost in equal stead. Although perhaps in opposite ways. The funny thing is that back in that case, the, the music was very powerful. The musicianship was very powerful. That's not something I could really say for, let's say, the instrumentalists in the background of this album. So in that hand, Ghost Dragon Attack Castle had actually a little bit more going for it. The solos were a lot more intricate. Everything was a lot more fast-paced. It was, uh, it was, it was a more impressive timekeeping style. Um, here, everything was much more laid back. It, it's, it's just less showier. Whether indeed it's easier or not is, is not really the point. But then the other thing is, is the vocalists. That was much more... Ghost Dragon Attacks Castle was, Castle was much more straightforward, much more raw, and raw can sometimes equate to bland. It's fun, but it is almost ad-libbed, at least in, in the sense of, of just speaking the words that are there, because it's meant to go along with having fun. Well, so is this in some sense, but it has that tragic element, which makes you want a much more impressive vocalist, and that was... Uh, this main female vocalist. So, in that sense, this had a much more uh, powerful ring. In the end, it comes down to theme, and frankly, I, I found, I found uh, Ghost Dragon Tex Castle to be themeless. This definitely does have a theme, but it's just, not, it's just not tight enough, because it all comes down to the other thing, and that is using the music to convey the said theme. It works in some instances, but it works almost incidentally, just by the the style of of the instrumentation, which tends to be pared down to begin with. So that by the time I get a track like um, like like the case of uh, the three part is a big man hounds burnt potato. Oh well, not even that. Uh, the uh, the the track in which we were discussing the woman who had been left on the island. Oh, uh, Marguerite. A, Marguerite. That is a track that I wanted to feel the setting, and I hate to say it, but musically, I just didn't. Right. Musically, it, it comes down to reading the words in the end, and hearing the words. And as beautiful as, as it is being sung, I feel like the music was just not making the best of it. The music was... it was routine. It was a routine way of telling a very gripping story. And when the music is not intertwined in that way, I just... I just can't hold it up very strongly. So unfortunately, this theme does not count for very much more than that direct comparison. And the, the number that I'm talking about is 3.75. That's what I gave Ghost Dragon Tax Castle. And this, for the sake of a theme that isn't quite as well-rounded, not as integrated, can only go up to a 3.8. All right. That seems fair for Steveism. I'm an ism. Sure, why not? All right, We're going to sure. ism him. So, uh, I'm actually comfortable with that. Real talk, mm. Crash Chords audience. Um, obviously, we said earlier, uh, a few moments ago, that Molly had to run. Um, due to unforeseen circumstances, she had to rush out of the city because half the Wasties live in Philly now. Um, but I'm going to do a phone interview with her, which will be inserted post this. Um, but before we get to that, I do want to uh, bring you another one of her songs. So... Molly, besides playing with the Wasties and playing with her mother, is also a wonderful folk musician in her own right, as I had said earlier, though she was trying to deflect the compliment. And she has an original work that she brought us. Um, also, I'll take this opportunity to thank Robert of the Wasties, who is here, um, not as a guest, but as an instrument. He played guitar for this track, as well as the first track you heard in the introduction. As um, well as harmonizing from time to time. Yes, and so I want to thank him, who is playing guitar on this track. This song is called... House that Jack built, and it is by Molly. The tower fell, I watched it go, watch it crumble to the ground, no longer part of any history you'll know, and stone by stone, she is laid to rest. And though it hurts her something awful, she will trust that you're the one who knows what's best. This was the house that Jack built. This was our body's home. This was the house that Jack built, and now it's gone. A young boy cries, a father yells. Says 
you'll never be a man till you can take a hit from someone like myself. Better off without you Cause of what he'd done before But now you're here And raising his house to the ground And though inside you might be screaming You learned early on to never make a sound This was the house that Jack built But looking at you now, I see the tightness in your smile. And I know it's probably for the best you never had a child. This was the house that Jack built, but you chose to stay alone. This was the house that Jack built and now it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, gone, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, gone. So that was... Molly singing How's the Jack Belt, which she uh, wrote, and I mean, it's, I love it. It's, it's a really I great actually, original track. I, I was very, very pleased to find out while we were listening to her record this that it was an original track. Yeah. I was, I was, I was impressed. So, um, it was beautifully done, and we thank her for, for that rendition. Um, now we're going to cut to me interviewing her via phone so, um, from Philly. I want to do it. But, um, what, you want to introduce me? And this is Matt Storm. Take it away, Storm. Hello, Molly. Hello, Matt. How are you? I'm good. Um, so... I appreciate you coming to do the podcast in person. I'm sorry that you had to rush to leave early, but I figure that we'll do some interviewing spiel now. um, And uh, I do have a few questions. The obvious first question I wanted to ask that I didn't get to Mm -hmm. ask yesterday is, was there, was the main influence for you getting into music, your mother, or did you kind of just stumble on it on your own as a kid? Oh, um, definitely my mom. (laughs) I I couldn't have missed it. Uh, I used to fall asleep to the sound of like three fiddles and a guitar in my living room um, for my almost my entire childhood. And, you know, because my mom was a working musician and a teacher, I was just always surrounded by it. I will say uh, the other thing my mom always likes to bring this up. We used to sing songs in the car because I would go to gigs with her. And, you know, sometimes we would travel for an hour, but sometimes we would travel for 10 hours. And, excuse me. Um, And that was definitely a huge thing, too. There are songs that I still know that are still in my repertoire that were taught to me, you know, driving up the Big Sur of California when I went on tour with her when I was eight, and some of them even younger than that. I will say I did have, like, a rebellious phase where I was like, I hate folk music. I don't like this. 
and um and kind of ventured into other things but I kind of came back to it in college because um I was taking Irish Gaelic and my teacher had us listening to all these folk songs and that's kind of what brought me back into it and what um what started the idea of you know me being in a Celtic band with my mom Okay. And um, how early did you start actually singing, like performing? Um, hmm. I used to dance and sing in front of the stage when my mom was playing. Um, and a picture of me doing that was actually the inset album cover. I think I was about three. Um, in terms of being allowed up on stage, I think... Um, Barring maybe some little tiny performances, you know, to my teddy bears, uh, <laughs> was in, I mean, obviously I did lots of chorus and choir and stuff like that in school, but I was in the music man when I was 10. Oh, wow. And that was a big changing point for me. And just for our audience, so they know, because I'm aware that you're in many, many bands, what's the final count of how many individual bands you perform in now? Um, so... Miss Covered Mountains, mm -hmm. the waste, the Wasties, mm -hmm. Eli August and the Abandoned Buildings. Uh, I sing backup for Painless Parker sometimes, um, and I'm working up uh, a cool kind of folk influenced band that's going to be called Rare Spirits. Okay, so clearly you, you're you always bored and you never have anything to do. You have no desire no. to perform ever. I have so much free time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, but I think that's great that, that you apply your talents to different places. And I mean, I've obviously seen you perform in many different bands and you always bring something a little different to each. I've even watched, I, I remember when you sang backup vocals for Rose West as well. Oh Which yes, was... that too. I forgot that one. <laughs> that counts also. Add that in. Um, and so, you know, clearly you keep yourself busy. Um, I know that with the Wasties, you guys mostly do covers, although you're starting to work on um, original songs. Um, when you're writing for yourself and for your solo stuff, is it does it come easy to write original works? Do you do a lot of original works, or is it mostly still covers? Um, writing material is something that I'm just starting to figure out. Um, I did a little bit of writing when I was a teenager and then in a very teenage way decided that it was all crap, which it probably was. Someday I'll find those journals. But, um, but uh, I write two different ways. One's easy and one's really hard. The easy one is when an entire piece or chunk of a song will just pop into my head. Um, that's how House of Jack Belt got written. And it was, you know, a whole thing just popped into my head, fully formed, like the lyrics, the music, and granted the, the lyrics got editing, but the whole idea was there. I think I wrote the first two verses in all of two minutes, and it just was that I had to write it down. Um, however, that waiting for that inspiration to strike, <laughs> um, those types of things are sometimes few and far between. So in a different way, um, another way I write is I'll come up with an idea that I want to write about, and I just kind of force myself to slog through and write everything down and then tear down from that. Um, the thing I'm starting to learn now that I'm starting to write a lot more is that I'm really good at writing one idea in the song. Like I can write a really good bridge or really good chorus musically. And then for me to get from... Uh, or a, a really good verse or a really good chorus. But for me to get from the verse and figure out what the chorus to that song should be, I actually kind of need a writing partner. Mm -hmm. I need someone with me to mix up the chords. Otherwise, I'll end up writing everything to one melody. So Rob and I have actually been uh, working a lot together on stuff like that. Well, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I was talking to John because, I mean, the audience knows already because we said it on air. We're going to say it on air when they listen to the whole thing. But this is being recorded in pieces because you had to go. But after you had left, I was talking to John. And John said he was incredibly giddy once he found out that House That Jack Built was an original because he loved it. Um, he oh. enjoyed it so much. And so it's it's nice to hear 
Like, I mean, I love the race season. I love Painless Parker and I love Rose West. And I, I love hearing you guys together, but I also like hearing your individual projects. And this last night was the first time I'd really heard you do your own thing on your own, you know, because when you're with Eli, you're in the mix and, you know, you're mostly backing vocals with some lead work. Same with Rose West, same with Painless Parker. You know, Wasties, you take the lead, but you're still usually accompanied by others. So it was nice to hear you perform solo and do it so well. Thank you. Um, so obviously uh, you're very rooted in the folk scene and that's where a lot of your influence comes from. Do you have any major influences that are outside of folk, something that would be unexpected based on most of your performance styles? Oh, I don't know if it's unexpected. Um, definitely the Beatles. Yeah. They are, I mean, they're an obvious answer, but they're huge and they are, were super there in my formative years. I mean, the other thing is that I come from a musical theater background as well, which means that there's a different sort of storytelling that happens there. Um, I think that musical theater and folk are actually close as they are both so strongly rooted in storytelling. They just cho choose to tell the story using a very different technique. Um, and that's also huge in terms of um, strong influences. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm not honestly surprised that the Beatles are a huge influence since they pretty much influence everything because they're responsible for the very early roots of a lot of modern music. So Yeah. That, that, they were um, also the one of the few things that my mom and I could agree to listen to in the car on those long trips. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good that you found common ground with that. Yeah. Uh, um, so I know that you live in Philly currently and that you used to live in Brooklyn, but where were, did you grow up in New York? I'm pretty sure I remember you saying that you came here for school, but you grew up somewhere else. Yeah, I grew up in Amherst, Massachusetts, which is uh, fondly known as the crankiest little town in the U.S. of A. And why is that? Oh, it's a very, very uppity, politically correct college town, and we make a lot of ruckus when things that we don't like are happening ev everywhere else in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that explains it. Yep. Uh, um, uh, obviously you've gone on tour before and, uh, I'm sure you will go again. Um, what, what are your, a few things that you like to do to keep yourself busy while on tour, like in your downtime besides writing, obviously? Um, I love reading. I love reading. Uh, it's something I haven't had enough time to do recently. And then, uh, this is a silly thing. I deleted the Facebook app from my phone a couple of days ago. And and I've, like, actively decided that instead of tooling around on the Internet for in my, like, 5, 10 minutes, 20 minutes of downtime that I get, I'm going to read. Um, I bought a bunch of new books, and I'm going to get a library card because reading used to be the thing that I did just um, to relax. Right. And it's kind of gotten replaced by other things um, because my downtime is so infrequent. Right. But um, but I want to start reading a lot more again. I miss it. You have I, a, have. I was going to say, do you have any uh, recommendations for the listeners, a book that you would recommend highly at this moment that you oh, have I, read recently? I just finished Horns by Joe Hill, and it's amazing. <laughs> That's the one that Daniel Radcliffe is doing the movie for, right? Yes, yes. Okay. And the book is absolutely stunning. Um, the way my friend put it is that it was as if John Irving had started dabbling in supernatural fiction. It's brilliantly written. Oh, cool. All right. Well, I'll definitely have to check that out. I had had some interest and in, I mean, the movie trailer looked really good and I always like seeing Daniel Radcliffe do something besides Harry Potter because I think he's a very good actor, but he still has to prove himself. I think at this point. Yeah. It's hard when you're, um, when you're labeled with one character that's so iconic. Yeah, it, it's tough to break through that, but uh, but I'll definitely have to check out that book. I had some interest in it. I wasn't sure if it was just a YA title or if it was something else. I can never tell these days what books mm -hmm. are considered YA and which aren't. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I tend to not really read a lot of YA. So Yeah, no, it's definitely not, not young adult fiction. Oh, that's good. It is for grown-ups. 
Um, now, I know that um, I believe that we've told the story on air about how the Wastings got together um, as a band. But um, how did you end up meeting the group and becoming friends? Was it around the same time, just drinking at the same place? It was a little bit earlier. Um, it was uh, kind of a all hanging out at the same watering hole type thing. Um, I was friends with Alex and Rob's roommate at the time. And um, she invited me over to start hanging out with them and hanging out with their kind of like friends collective. Um, and Sarah and I found out through sitting next to each other at the bar that we went to NYU together and had the same Irish studies professor. Oh, cool. So it was kind um, of almost predestined for the Wasties to exist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, obviously I can say on air now while I'm interviewing you, because I've already said it before when you aren't around, but you are probably single-handedly responsible, you and that bar, for me meeting Sarah and spending the rest of my <laughs> life with her. So I am thankful for that. Well, because, you're welcome. <laughs> you know, spending, you know, hanging out as, mu as long as we had at the way station. You go, man, you're going to go home and see my band. And you would harass me month after month to see it. And I finally did. And it was all downhill or uphill from there. Um, <laughs> but I thought an official on-air podcast thank you was in order as well. Oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> and thank you for thanking me. It's very sweet. Well, you know, I, I credit is, you know, credit to do where it's due. Um, is there any other kinds of music you'd like to branch into? Because I know that you're, a lot of the bands you're in right now are mostly riding the line between folk and trad, which, you know, I like the way she's obviously branched out a little outside it because they pull from other genres too a bit. But do you have like a genre that you haven't touched at all that you're really interested in giving a shot? Oh, I don't I'd be very intimidated, but I'm a big fan of the blues. Mm hmm um, I like, and this is the other thing, and I feel like I ought to mention this. I love singing folk music, but a big revelation for me was um, when I started singing backing vocals for the Rose West, because that is the only context in which I am allowed to sing at the full volume of my voice and not have to worry. Right. <laughs> it's kind of great. <laughs> <laughs> you have permission to be loud. That doesn't happen very often. Well, yeah, also, especially considering a lot of traditional and, and Irish folk and, and other folk is very kind of subdued in places and controlled, whereas, you know, any kind of rock or prog, it's like, let's belt it out and see where it goes. Yeah. Um, what was the other thing? John had sent me, it was said he was going to send me a bunch of questions, and of course he didn't, so I'm, I'm rolling solo as far as asking questions. Um, okay. Is there... Is there um, this is kind of a cheesy question, but I like asking artists about it because we it. do have an in, an interested audience from a certain range. But do you have any words of wisdom for people trying to get into music or struggling with writing or struggling with arts of any kind, like something you would recommend to help push to that next level or get through it? Listen to masters. Um, listen to them and... Um, and if there are any who live near you, like, go bug them politely. Hmm. Um, I learned kind of at my mom's heels. And I was super lucky to have her as my mom. But what she did was she would go sit in at Hunter Dances and play in the back on mic so that she could learn all the tunes from all these old guys playing them. And um, at least for anything in a folk tradition, um, I guess I, I would be remiss if I didn't recommend and give the advice to uh, go back to the primary source. Don't just listen to the modern interpretations of what people are doing. Go back and find the primary source and listen to that. And then listen to the people that they listened to, if that makes any sense. Oh, um, totally does. Get as far back into the tradition as you can that so you know where it came from so you can do it justice. That seems like very, very intelligent and sage advice. Well, um, I'm an old soul. Yeah, so old. <laughs> you're, you're a wee baby. You're, you're, My you're... old soul, 
I said. An old well, soul. That's, that's true. Your feet are very old. But <laughs> Um, now a question from left field, because I like throwing weird things into the mix. If you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what food would that be? What food? Uh, one food for the rest of my life. Burritos. <laughs> Just burritos till the day you die. Yeah, that's my impulse. Oh, burritos or, like, steak and potatoes and asparagus. That's the two, like, like, like a steak dinner meal. There you go. <laughs> Um, I'm guessing that you're a big fan of steak then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that the Wasties collectively would yell at me when I would order anything well done. And yes. you should be happy to know that I'm now currently eating most things medium or medium rare. So. <laughs> we'll get you down in no, no time. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um but uh, but yeah, it was a it was a blast having you on the show, and I really liked the band that you brought us. Um, even though I took you know I had minor issues with the album, which I think we were all in line with mostly that you know some traditional sound can get a little repetitive and can get a little boring when they're not really doing something else with it or putting a personal spin on it. The songs where they did, you know, really stood out. Um, but I'm excited to hear their new album, and I I'm. I'm liking hearing more stuff outside of the frame of what I'm used to, because as I was telling Stephen John uh, the other day, most of my frame of reference to folk is friends of mine. Like, I listen to some folk on my own, but most of it is from Painless, Broken, Hungry, The Way Steve, Eli August, because I just never really had a lot of exposure to folk growing up. So I'm excited mm -hmm. every time I hear a new band that's of, of a folk trad kind of way. Um, them being very good because it's 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 not common on the radio anymore um unless it depends on the station you're listening to i mean radio is not so popular anymore anyway but at least growing up when i was listening to radio there wasn't a ton of it you know mm -hmm. you can usually find one station in the bundle but yeah it's it's a it's a I don't want to say it's an acquired taste. That's not right. It's a specific genre. It, it doesn't get put on pop stations or on top 100 stations a lot. So it's going through a little renaissance, if you will. Yeah. Well, also it's now a quasi renaissance. Well, also now with the internet, like there's an audience for everyone because you can yeah. get access to it. So unless you truly suck, um, someone will listen to you somewhere. Yes, that's true. Um, do you have any goals or aspirations outside of music that you're interested in pursuing? Besides, obviously, I've mentioned it on the podcast before, you are also a burlesque performer. Um, but beyond, beyond those two things that you already do very well now, is there anything else you'd want to reach for artistically that you want to try? Um, I, um, hmm. Ooh, this is a toughie. I I love dancing. I studied dance for years, and I went to school again for musical theater, so I did a lot of that. Um, and I really enjoy it. Um, I would never want to do it professionally, so I guess that's out of the um, <laughs> it's out of the running. Um, no, uh, I'm. I'm good at organizing and running things. Uh, so that's, you know, I wouldn't mind someday like organizing a festival or something like that. Um, though for now, my goal is pretty solidly on make a living with music. Once I'm there, I'll, I'll start to branch out. I'm sure. Well, that makes sense. Um, and I know that you're pushing very hard in like four different directions with four different bands to, make music your career so eventually somewhere it'll take off and, and you can well here's the other thing it's uh there's different types of goals um one of the things that i really appreciate from having my mom growing up is i know that it's possible to make a living from music um and it doesn't have to be like your band takes off it just has to be you got to be really good and you have to work really hard and you can make a living. You won't make a million dollars, but you can make a living. Um, now, granted, don't get me wrong. I would love to make a million dollars, <laughs> <laughs> but I know that it's possible to push through and 
and to make a living even if, you know, you don't hit that lucky jackpot because that's really what it is. It's a lottery. Well, yeah, and I also find that, like, uh, uh, the definition of success is more personal definition than – there's a broad definition, but who cares? Like, if you can mm-hmm. – if, if to you, being successful as a musician is being able to pay all of your bills just playing music, then that's success. And when you can do that, you're a success, you know? Yep. Um, do you have any performance dates coming up um, that you want to tell the, the audience about, the fans about? Um, I'm sure you're playing a Wasties gig in September since you guys play at the Waste Station every month. Um, do you yes, know that? The... There's three. I got three. Okay. Um, Eli August and the Abandoned Buildings CD release party is Saturday, September 6th at the Bitter End, I believe at 8 o'clock. Though it might be 9, but there's a Facebook event for it. Check that. Um, their Wasties are playing the third Thursday of the month at the Way Station. Um, and then September 27th, Mist Covered Mountains and is playing in uh, Philly at a house concert. Um, so if you like Mist Covered Mountains on Facebook, that's totally free, and you will get the info on that. Awesome. Um, I thank you again for being a part of this. Um, you are just another notch on my goal of getting every wasty individually on the podcast. Um, you're now the third. It started with Pamus Parker, then followed by Sarah Biz, and now you. Um, the next goal is Robert, and then the lofty goal of trying to get Alex on the podcast by himself. <laughs> I have to tell you, he's shaking his head at me right now. Oh, well, that's good. Um, very drunk. We'll get him very drunk. Yeah, that's it. I mean, R- <laughs> Rob, and, Rob and Steve, the first time we did the Wasties podcast, had this brilliant idea of doing a drunk cast. So we'll just have to no, do the drunk, drunk cast. cast. Yeah, and that'll be Alex's feature. Um, but I'm super appreciative of, as a friend, for all the wonderful things you've done for me over the last year or two. And as a fan of music, I mean, I love the work that you do and I'm so excited whenever I get to hear new stuff. Um, the last favor I will ask you is, so we, we pre-recorded our outro and mm-hmm. I butchered the names of those two songs you sent me. So, <laughs> so our audience knows what the hell I'm talking about in a, you know, another few minutes from now. Can you please pronounce them properly so when I butcher them, they can point and laugh even harder at me? So it's um, the Bad Squire, the um, House that Jack built, and then the last two songs are the Lonton Golosky Door, and it goes into Spansel Hill. It's a medley of the two. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> it was uh, a pleasure getting to hear you perform and see you perform. Um, and we definitely would love to have you go- on again in the new year. Um, I always appreciate everything the Wasties do for me and, and what you do for us and for music. So thank you again for, for doing the show and being a part of this. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. Excellent. And we will do it again soon. Cool. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you, Molly. I really appreciate all of this. Thank you. All right. I'll see you later. All right. Bye. Bye. It was a pleasure to get to talk to Molly again um, and to do the interview. Um, I'm really grateful that she was able to come on the podcast. I do appreciate all of the Wasties. Um, That first live performance podcast that we did with the Wasties, I've said it before, was kind of a big part of our growth as a podcast because we got a real sense of how we can handle having live musicians on. Um, And it was fun to do just a straight-up interview episode, which we hadn't really done at that point. And it was also an eye-opener for how hard it is to do more than six people at once. Uh, Oh, yeah. I was like, there was only five members of the band. There's three of us. But there's three of us, yes. Um... Before we uh, close out the podcast, we, of course, wouldn't be us without doing a spam. So, Steve, do you have a spam for us? Oh, do I? Undeniably, imagine that you stated. Your favorite reason appeared to be at the web the easiest factor to be aware of. I say to you, I certainly get irked whilst other people think about concerns that they just do not recognize about. You managed to hit the nail upon the highest as smartly as outlined out the whole thing without having side effects. Other folks can take a signal. We'll likely be again to get more. Thank you. Oh, that was on the cusp of being awesome. Almost. The middle bit was almost like a real compliment. Well, uh, who was that by? No, not just... That was by Chapter 7 Bankruptcy Clients in Michigan. See, my problem Wait, with... bankruptcy is not Chapter 7. Uh, uh... 
I don't know that it matters. No, the, but the, no, you're right. It's a different the, chapter. I know, but no. but the elegance what was so there seven? up until the ending, where it just got a little bit too. No, you were mistaking that for my delivery. Thank you. Your delivery was excellent then. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you should be you should be Shakespeare when you grow up. I'll Steve. work on that. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful spam read, as always, Steve. Um, next week is your pick. Yeah. Next week is indeed my pick. I had this little deliberation, and I decided to go a little bit more in the medium ground with this. Nothing what too outlandish. Well, as like my my other alternative would have been something much more in your face. Ah, uh, okay. So what did you end up settling? I on? may still end up doing that later, but I'll hold off. But this is is a band that I actually uh, fell in love with because of a movie. Interestingly enough, uh, that movie was Stranger Than Fiction. Oh, it's a good movie. The movie features, uh, it was either one or, or perhaps two tracks by Spoon. Oh, awesome. right. I forgot so they had a new album out. We oh, are thank doing you. Thank you. Spoon. They Want My Soul is the name of the album. And I'm very curious to see what Spoon has been doing because they were a very, um, not overtly so, but yeah, it, they did their job as an emotional band for me. And I think it came straight out of their, uh, the soundtrack usage in that movie. It was slow, it was contemplative, and yet it didn't seem overtly moody. It was it was accessible. I think it was I think it was an emotional band accessible to a wide audience. And I I think that was a very powerful thing back then. Let's hope it still is. Okay. Um, a, a little bit of a post amble instead of a preamble like we usually do. Um, I do want to uh, take a moment to again thank. Spider One of Power Man 5000 because I got to chat with him when I went to see him and his band Power Man 5000 and Head PE last Thursday. Um, Mark Young, who we've mentioned several times on the podcast now, um, was wonderful enough to give me a comp ticket to their show. I actually had a plus one, but couldn't get anyone to come with. But um, but I had a blast. Um, both bands were great, and I just want to take a moment to say that I'll never enjoy a band more than when they're comfortable in their own skin. When they finally find themselves. And something that Head P.E. did in their new record, and I talk about it a little bit in the review, is they finally got to the point where they don't give a damn anymore. They just want to be them. The last three tracks of their record are straight-up mm-hmm. reggae tracks. And Jared, the lead singer, is a guy who comes out dressed and acts very thug. He's got a hat over his eyes. He's got a jersey on. He's pulling on his clothes. He's popping and locking. But he was so overwhelmed by the positive response of the crowd. He was cracking smiles, even though he was singing you know, these very aggressive lyrics. And at one point, he actually has a speech about how he's trying to be a better person for his son. So it was very interesting to see this band who doesn't really care about an image anymore or anything. They just want to play their music that they like. Like, at one point, this guy is playing a melodica for one of the reggae tracks. Like A what? A melodica. It's a, it's a woodwind keyboard instrument. Oh, okay. I know what a melodica is. Um, and it was cool to see. Um, So I appreciate Mark giving me the ticket. I got to talk to Spider after the show and thank him for the interview on autographs. And he remembered and said we should definitely do another one soon, which is great. And I'm hoping to do that. Um, But I had a blast at the show. I like watching. These are both bands who've been around a while and are done trying to fit a a genre or a mold. And they're just going to play whatever songs they want. And you've got to respect that, you know, because when you're a musician long enough... It eventually doesn't always just become about the fans. It's about you enjoying yourself. And I could see that on stage. And I plan on doing a write-up about it, which is in process. So stay tuned for that. Um, Cheers. What? Cheers. 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 Um, moving on to our, of course, wrap-up. Um, so, of course, check us out on Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter. Send us your recommendations, suggestions, questions, comments. Um, we have a donation button on the site. We're trying to always improve and add stuff, add features, tra- even possibly travel, go purchase more elaborate albums, whatever. We're trying to add more to the show and keep the website running because it does cost money. So your donations help with that. I have this personal ambition of recording the podcast in, in the monasteries of Tibet. So get those donations in. Um, you, keep, you keep dreaming. Also, um, as you know, That's if you check the Facebook page or my personal page... <laughs> In October, I'm playing Extra Life 2014, um, which is 24-hour gaming marathon for charity for children's hospitals. Um, There's a link on our Facebook page. Please throw your donations my way if you feel compelled to support the children. 
um, I would greatly appreciate that. Or tune in, I will post a link. I'm going to stream all day me playing video games and board games. Please think of the children. Won't someone please think, think of the children? children. Um, other than that, um, I guess this is a good point to introduce the final performance of this podcast. Um, Molly wouldn't be Molly without doing a beautiful acapella track. She has a wonderful voice, and so she actually sang a mostly Gaelic song, um, two songs, uh, one which is the title of, and I'm going to butcher these, I'll have her correct them in the interview, uh, Spinnacle Hill, and the other one she sent me the phonetics is Glanton Glasgly Dowar. <laughs> Butchered. <laughs> Um, it is a uh, foreign language, but these correct? are both acapella tracks that your sh- whiteness has never been more apparent. Shine straight through. Well, but, but the they're Irish, white too. Yeah, the Irish they're white pretty too. white. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but but so this, this. is a, we're going to take you out with an acapella track. Um, we, I want to thank Molly again for being a guest, and I want to thank Robert for playing guitar for her. We will have him back as a full fledged gla- guest to talk about Rose West soon, and I think this is a great place to say, as always. She's music not here is, to say it. Well, she we is. We have a, to imitate her. Music is life, and, and life, life is good. good. Disclaimer: it may not be Molly. Kids, learn a slave to Mirga, Honda, you know. I guess God hates learn a good article art, and as to us, can keep school. Nor a loish, we shall hard the loch yon loy. Last night as I lay dreaming Of pleasant days gone by Me mind been bent on rambling To Ireland I did fly I stepped on board a vision and I followed with a will Till at last I came to anchor at the cross at Spansel Hill It been on the 23rd of June, the day before the fair when Ireland's sons and daughters and friends assemble there, the young, the old, the brave and the bold, their duty to fulfill at the parish church at Clooney, a mile from Spansel Hill. And I went to see the neighbors to see what they might say. Well, the old ones were all dead and gone, and the young ones turning gray. I met the tailor quickly, he's as bold as ever still. Sure, he used to mend me breeches when. I lived on Spansel Hill And I paid a flying visit To my first, my only love She's as white as any lily And as gentle as a dove She threw her arms around me Saying, Johnny I love you still And she's an old farmer's daughter And the prize of Spansel Hill I dreamt I held and I kissed her As in the days of yore Ah, oh, Johnny, you're only joking As many a time before and the cock, he crew in the morning, and he crew both loud and shrill. And I awoke in California, many miles from Spansel Hill. 
Yes, the cock, he crew in the morning, and he crew both loud and shrill. And I awoke in California, many miles from Spansel Hill.